zombies dream of undead sheep, of course. And uh, so uh, our speaker today, though, is Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, is Bradley Wojtek, his co-author is Timothy Burstein. And uh, so uh, Bradley just came up today from uh, San Diego. He's a neuroscientist, cognitive scientist and neuroscientist at UC San Diego. Uh, and uh, so this is his first book on this where he does research on zombies, well, research on real people. Uh, but I, I found it interesting that uh, he has applied for grant information, uh, grant, a grant application for the uh, Zombie Research Society uh, regarding the upcoming zombie apocalypse, uh, which, you know, you never know. Ebola could cause this. <laughs> so uh, with that, please help me welcome Dr. Bradley Boytek. So much like everything else about this book, we are not actually applying for a grant. It's all tongue in cheek. Uh, so <clears throat> as Michael said, today I'm going to talk about cognitive networks in the noisy brain. So I'm a professor at UC San Diego of cognitive, uh, neuroscience, cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, uh, and at the Institute for Neural Computation. So in my research, I, I mostly focus on the way that low frequency oscillations can coordinate communication via spike timing in the human brain and animal brains. Uh, and so one way that we do that is by actually doing research on people who are undergoing brain surgery for usually epilepsy. So these people have electrodes implanted uh, on their brains, on the surface of their brains, for up to two weeks. And this provides us an incredible look into actual neural activity. Normally we have a trade-off in neuroscience in brain imaging between where in the brain something is happening and when. Uh, so with non-invasive methods like scalp EEG, which records electrical activity on the surface of the brain, we know when something is happening but not where. And with fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, we know where something is happening but not when. fMRI measures blood oxygenation, uh, which is a very slow process in response to neural activity. Scalp EEG measures electrical activity, but the skull smooths that activity out. It's like trying to figure out how many people are having a conversation on another side of a wall. Um, and so one way that we approach this is by not only recording brain activity from people undergoing brain surgery, but we use LNP models, which are not, uh, linear, nonlinear Poisson spiking models to simulate neural activity. And these model spiking probabilities are modulated by a, um, you know, I'm just kidding. Let's talk about zombies. I actually really would like to talk about my research, and I'm sure some people in the room would want to hear about it, but uh, this is why everybody's here. So uh, this is a total accident, uh, how this entire thing started. So uh, to be quite frank, uh, my friend Tim Versteinen, he's now a professor at Carnegie Mellon, uh, also in cognitive and computational neuroscience. Uh, he and I would get together with our friends, our girlfriends at the time, now our wives, um, during our PhDs at Berkeley, and we'd have movie nights. And both of us were sci-fi, horror, movie, comic book fans. And so they tended towards that. And what happens when you get a bunch of PhD neuroscience students together in a room after drinking beer uh, and watching zombie movies is they start trying to diagnose a zombie. Uh, and that's kind of how this came about. And so I'm going to give two disclaimers. First is that all the science I'm about to show is 100% real. The methods, brain areas, and disorders are all true. Obviously, the zombies are not. Uh, and although sometimes, fair warning, uh, the truth can be scarier than fiction. So we are actually part of the Zombie Research Society, which uh, that is something that was started by a guy here in LA, actually, Matt Moak, who gave uh, cold called me uh, one summer afternoon. I was on vacation with my wife. Uh, and I got this phone call from this guy who said he had seen a talk I gave where I mentioned that I was into horror movies and science fiction and comic books. And he said, do you happen to be into zombies by any chance? This is just a random phone call I got. Um, so Matt used to be a... Uh, film student at NYU, and he was going to start something called Matt's Zombie Blog, because he was into zombie movies and wanted to write about them, decided that sounded lame, so he called it the Zombie Research Society, and then started getting phone calls from media at around Halloween asking him about the science behind zombies, and he said, I'm not a scientist, I have no idea. So then he started cold calling scientists to see if anybody wanted to take a part of this. So now Matt is a uh, multi-published author. Uh, he's written several books about zombies now. He's also on The Talking Dead, uh, quite frequently, which is the, uh, sh the half an hour, I think it's half an hour, hour long thing after The Walking Dead every, every episode. So he sort of found his own little niche. And Tim and I play kind of the straight guys. So Matt always talks about the zombie apocalypse and we're always, no, no, Matt, no, no, no zombie apocalypse. Zombies aren't real. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. 
So the second disclaimer is that the talk will contain a few clips of violence and gore and pictures of real brains. Uh, and if that bothers you, then I'm sorry. You paid. We can skip. You know, maybe people paid for this one. So I've never had people actually come and pay money for a talk before. This is my zombie inception slide. This is me talking about me, talking about me, talking about zombies. Um, <laughs> so this has become ridiculously popular. I, I'm really surprised at how much this took off. Because like I said, this was just something that we did as a goof. It was a tongue-in-cheek, to be quite frank, and I think we talked about this in the book, it was a way to cheat to get people to be interested about neuroscience, while at the same time making fun of neuroscientists. So there's a lot of neuroscience garbage out there, to be quite frank. Uh, people in my field, and I, I, I will be honest about this, will, will oversell results all the time. Oxytocin is the love hormone. No, it's not. They found the brain area that makes you love your iPhone. No, they haven't. This kind of stuff appears all the time. That you love your iPhone thing is actually a New York Times article. Um, this stuff is everywhere, and we have very little idea about how anything more complicated than going like this <laughs> actually works in the brain. Um, and so we, we use the fact that we can very plausibly invent reasonable sounding diagnosis for something as ridiculous as a zombie as a way of showing how easy it is to use fuzzy language of modern neuroscience to come up with plausible sounding things for totally ridiculous stuff. Um, and actually this, this here uh, is, uh, this is an MRI, a magnetic resonance image. In gray is the real MRI of a real person. I don't remember if this is maybe Tim's brain or my brain, I don't remember. But it slices, it's called a transaxial slice. It's, it's images this way through the brain. And in orange are what we think the zombie brain would have to look like in order to give rise to some of the functions or dysfunctions that you see in a zombie. Um, so I have two younglings, which is why I am not gonna be able to stick around for too terribly long tonight. These are the two. Uh, I am somewhat zombie-like because of them. Uh, they don't, I don't sleep much anymore. Uh, that's Gavin and Linnea. And you know what? It turns out that somebody else has already thought of this. <laughs> so this is from How to Be a Dad, which is a pretty funny parenting website. And it does a comparison between the zombies and the babies. For those of you that can't read it, they both have sparse, messy heads of hair with incomplete sets of teeth, constant oral excretions, and speaking and moaning and screaming. Uh, both have sharp dirt cake nails in the funk of 40,000 years aroma with insatiable and aggressive appetites. Worn, ill-fitting clothes, clumsy random motor skills, and unstable lurching walking. So not only do I share this because this is how I feel, um, and the general attributes, by the way, are messy eaters, no sense of right or wrong, bent on destruction, keep you awake at night in fear, and can turn others into zombies. <laughs> this actually nails all of the stereotypical zombie things. So this is, this is pretty much the approach that we took in trying to diagnose a zombie, which is what are the canonical stereotypical zombie behaviors, right? That slow, lumbering walk, uh, the inability to speak. It's not like you're going to have a conversation with them. They're not going to write Shakespeare or anything like that, right? Uh, so there are certain kinds of stereotype behaviors. Anytime, anytime you have a stereotype behavior, you can then try and do the reverse inference and say, where in the brain is that happening? And this is, like I said, been really crazy because <laughs> I got to meet George Romero and I, I actually accidentally interviewed him for an hour on stage. So George Romero, uh, he, he directed the original Night of the Living Dead in 1967, the first modern zombie movie. And we were at a conference together uh, in Seattle, ZombieCon, back in 2010. And he was going to be on a panel about fast versus slow zombies. <laughs> and, the, and the interviewers who were supposed to interview him on stage never showed up. And so the, the organizer was in a panic and he comes up to me and he's like, you're the only other speaker here. Can you interview George Romero for me on stage? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And it was the dumbest interview because uh, I asked him at one point, very point blank, I said, hey, uh, so everybody's here for this fast versus slow thing. Why in the original Night of the Living Dead did you make your zombies slow? And he looked at me like I was a complete moron because he said, they're dead. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> this is a, uh, we call our guerrilla science. Uh, this is actually a poster we hung up at the annual Society for Neuroscience conference. So the Society for Neuroscience Conference is the major multinational, uh, international conference every year. 35,000 neuroscientists attend this conference every year. Um, and think of your high school um, science fair, where you have the sort of three board poster to talk about the you know, reaction between uh, vinegar and you know, uh, baking soda to make, but for brain stuff, and multiplied by 4,000 times. 
because uh, there's just aisles after aisles after aisles of poor, lonely graduate students standing next to their poster for four hours, hoping somebody will walk by and pay attention to them. <laughs> and so we hung this up. This is, our, this is our consciousness deficit hypoactivity disorder, a case study of CDHD, which is our clinical sounding term for zombieism. <laughs> and we presented it, and we, did, we, we, we sort of just hung it up and, and stood back and sat, sat, sat away. And it started going, like, few, uh, grad students started tweeting about it. They're like, you have to see this poster over on aisle seven, blah, blah, blah. It's the most amazing research I've ever seen. <laughs> and so all of these people are going over to our poster, and they're looking at it. And they're doing, you know, you, you can see the moment when they get to the point where they're like, ah, oh. yeah. <laughs> they thought they were going to see some like new Nobel Prize winning research and said they got, they got fooled or trolled or I don't know what you'd want to say. Um, but what was great about this was uh, I have a picture of a security guard who was working at the conference standing there and reading this poster. And that was kind of the moment for me when I realized this might actually work because I, I promise you I've been to a lot of these conferences and I've never seen the security staff that works at these conferences, reading and chuckling at, at one of these posters before. Right? They're all technical jargon, nonsense, uh, that unless you are in that sub, sub, sub field, you have no idea what they're actually saying. Uh, and so for me, that was kind of the moment where I was like, okay, this is actually a pretty good way of, of maybe talking about something that's really complicated. And it's, it's weird because talking about neuros neuroscience has such a um, popular appeal that it's, it's, it's easy in some ways to talk about neuroscience uh, but it's also really easy to do that over inflation, right? You're like, well, if I just hype up my research a little bit, then I can be on, you know, uh, I don't know, The Daily Show or something, right? Uh, it, it would be really easy to go down that path, and, and we wanted to try and avoid doing that in our science outreach, which is why we just tried to take something so blatantly ridiculous. Um, and it, like I said, it, it really has taken off. We, we did this thing, TED Ed, so the TED Talk series do these <sighs> educational videos, they're three minutes long, and somebody animates them, and we got something like 250,000 views on this TED Ed video. And these are for classrooms, so, so uh, teachers can flip these into part of their lectures. And I think something like 11,000 teachers across the US have, have turned these into a, like a lecture for their classes at high schools. Um, and we were approached by Princeton University Press. They approached us after we'd done a series of blog posts about this and said, turn this into a book. And we're like, oh, okay, we've never done that before. Um, neither of us had ever written a book, so it was a crazy fun. And uh, so in, in another life, I'm also a data scientist. Uh, no longer, I'm, I'm fully full-time uh, researcher at UC San Diego now, but I used to be, I was the first data scientist for Uber. I don't know if you guys know the company Uber. Uh, so I was with them for about three and a half years doing data science, and uh, the, one of the inspirations for sort of the public-facing communication of the data that I had for my blog posts that I wrote for them was OkCupid, which is a dating website. And OKCupid okay used to do these blog posts called OK, OK Trends, which are actually kind of bad statistics, um, but they had some fun nuggets in there. And one of my favorites is this one from one of their blog posts, which was they're looking at what words in the initial contact email that you sent somebody that you're interested in, in communicating with through the dating website were more likely to get you a response. <laughs> and so banned was the first one. You're 42% more likely to get a response if you had the word banned in your first uh, reaching out email. But the fourth word was zombie. So if you <laughs> mentioned something about zombies in your initial contact email, you are 41-ish percent more likely to get a response email. So I used to joke that not only are zombies cool and interesting right now, but zombies can also potentially get you laid. <laughs> so zombie behaviors. Where, where did, what did we have to go on? So this is uh, 28 days later, by the way. I, ha I, I feel like I have to say, Night of the Living Dead is my favorite zombie movie. I feel like I have to say that's like, you, you know, okay, well, that's a given. After that, 20, it's either a toss up between 28 Days Later or Shaun of the Dead. Shaun of the Dead because it's <laughs> incredibly funny, but also if you are a zombie genre aficionado, the number of in jokes in that movie, they, they clearly love the genre. Um, 28 Days Later, I enjoyed until I read, there's a professor, I forget, uh, English professor, history professor, um, I'll, I'll maybe share the, share the posts that, with you, uh, but it was a series of blog posts interpreting 28 Days Later through like a Hobbesian um, uh, uh, government organization and, and sort of struggle viewpoint that totally changed my, my interpretation of 28 Days Later. And it went from a very cool and fun, well done movie to a, there might be a whole other level that I wasn't appreciating this movie on. It was incredibly well done. Uh, and so this is classic scene. 
He's telling me he'll never bake bread, plant crops, raise livestock. He's telling me he's futureless. And eventually, he'll tell me how long the infected take to starve to death. So I love Cillian Murphy. He's a fantastic actor. He was great as Scarecrow. Uh, he's great in the, uh, what's that new TV series that he's in? What's it? Peaky Blinders. It's a fantastic show. He's really good in it. Uh, you, okay, you don't like it? Oh, okay. <laughs> I think he's great. I kind of have a man crush on this guy. But he does, like, the worst Keanu Reeves-like don't emote at all kind of thing in a series. <laughs> but he, he's really good in this movie. So what, what, what's, the, what's the takeaway? So they're saying um, zombies are never going to bake bread. They're never going to farm livestock. Right? There's, there's, no, there's no culture. Right? There's no long-term planning. There's no organization. Uh, it, it really gets to the meat of the idea that zombies are just uh, these un, uncaring, unthinking you know, horrors. Um, and <laughs> my, my, my Y fell, memoir E, uh, my Y fell down. Um, that's what I get for moving everything over from PowerPoint to Keynote. So what are the behaviors that we have to go on? Right? Sort of like the, the how to be a dad thing. Uh, this, this, this really hits on them. You have addictive behaviors, the insatiable craving for human flesh, uh, motor deficits, impulse control, aggression, memory, attention problems, language difficulties. We know a decent amount about all of these things, how, how the brain gives rise to some of these things anyway. Uh, I was telling Michael beforehand though, it's, it's, it's kind, of a, kind of an issue in the field. Uh, my take on neuroscience is that neuroscience carries a lot of baggage from psychology. I mean, psychology was first. We didn't know much about neurons in the brain. And so psychologists were studying things like memory and attention because these were behaviors that were clear that we have, we, we have memory, okay, we, we, we can know we can remember things. But then neuroscience came along and brain imaging and neuroscientists started saying, where in the brain is attention? But attention isn't a thing. Attention is a semantic placeholder for an idea. And then neuroscientists started looking for this fuzzy thing. And so it's problematic. And that, that's one of the things I want like, to, for you all to sort of take away from this is that uh, my take is rather than saying where in the brain is this fuzzy idea, we should be saying how can neurons, which we know some basic principles about, how can groups of neurons give rise in coordinating their behavior or activity to give rise to something that looks like what we call the behavior attention? And so sort of a bottom-up approach versus this, this top-down approach. Um, so we have observations in the wild. <laughs> I love this movie. So our first inclination was to say zombies don't feel pain. The thing gets hit in the head and it just keeps going. That's sort of how it always goes. They can lose limbs, they just keep going. Uh, but we, we decided that that may not be the case. It may not be that zombies can't feel pain because there's a problem. If you can't feel pain, then you, you are less likely to feel other things as well. Um, so uh, in order to move, we also have this other sense, so we have the five senses, which is kind of not really very accurate. We also have other ones, one of them being proprioception, which is an awareness of our body in space, which allows me to do something like this and not fall over, right? Like I, I don't consciously think about where my leg is, but my body, there's a representation. I have a map of where my body is in space, which is actually what the Nobel Prize in Physiology was all about this year that was just awarded was this, this, where in the brain does this map of the body come from? And what's neat is not only do we have two maps, essentially. Uh, one is called the egocentric map, which is where is everything relative to me? So egocentrically, you are sort of to my right. And allocentrically, which is in absolute space, he's sitting at the front of this room. Um, and now if I turn this way, allocentrically, absolute space, he hasn't moved. Egocentrically, he's shifted 90 degrees or so. Uh, and there's two different maps overlapping in our brains, and those maps get compared, it seems, frequently, to allow for you to navigate in, a, in an absolute space relative to the uh, egocentric space, which is why you can use your memory to walk around your house at night in the dark without being able to see anything. You have an absolute map of your house uh, that is built up over time, and then you have a relative egocentric map of where you are. It's sort of like a GPS when you're driving your car, 
Uh, it's not that the, this con most GPSs aren't constantly sampling where you are. They're sort of inferring where you are based upon a variety of different sources. Um, even if they don't have a GPS signal, they can still make that inference. Car-based GPS ones can also use, you know, uh, I think your, your speed and things like that to try and figure it out. Um, and so if they had no sense of feel, feeling, touch, then we, 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 we argue that they wouldn't be able to figure out where they are in space. Um, and so there's two things. How could somebody not care about pain? You could either not feel it or you could ignore it, right, not react. And so we think they can feel pain, but they're not reacting. And we, we infer that because of the way that they can still move around fairly effectively. Um, and pain is interesting, actually. It's one of those philosophers of, neuro, of mind love pain because uh, there's tons of different things that we know about the basic mechanics of pain. I'm actually going to show you one. This kind of hurts, so don't do it if you don't want to. But um, um, if, you, if you flick your nail bed of your thumb really hard, uh, you will notice an immediate sharp pain and then kind of a throbbing pain about a half a second later. That delay is actually a physical delay. So the, the, the axons, the nerve fibers that carry pain, sharp pain, uh, from the, so you have, two you have multiple different kinds of neurons detect different senses of touch. You have epicritic touch, which is sharp, fine point discrimination. Those get into the brain very quickly. Whereas this dull throbbing pain, the axons actually propagate signals slower into the brain. So that delay is actually a propagation delay for the time it takes to get to your thumb, to your brain. Uh, and I actually once worked out some of the math trying to figure out um, a blue whale. So the longest neurons in the uh, body, the longest axons in the body, go from your tip of your toe all the way up to the base of your spinal cord at the back. So in a tall person, it'll be nearly two meters long. Um, and so given the conduction delay in human and given what we know about uh, axon sizes and things in blue whales, I figured out it might take up to six seconds for the uh, information from a blue whale's tail to get all the way up into its brain. Um, and this is actually a major problem in neuroscience in a lot of ways because it takes 17 milliseconds for information to go from your ear into your auditory cortex when it first enters consciousness. I'm using those very heavily right there. <laughs> um, and then it takes, but on the flip side, it takes about 73-ish milliseconds for visual information to go from your retina to your visual cortex. And yet if I go like this, you don't notice a 1 20th of a second delay between when you saw it and when you hear it. Um, and we're, you know, this is operating at too short of uh, distances for speed of sound versus speed of light propagation to really make a difference. Um, so that's called the binding problem. How is it that there can be a 1 20th of a second delay between when we see and when we hear, and yet they get unified into a single percept? Haha, -ha, teaching you neuroscience. <laughs> So zombies is a clinical disorder. This is our overly technical term. Consciousness deficit hypoactivity disorder is defined as the loss of rational, voluntary, and conscious behavior replaced by delusional impulsive regression, aggression, stimulus-driven attention, and the inability to coordinate motor or linguistic behaviors. This is one of the first ways and the only way for a long time that we had to map anything related to uh, brain to behavior actually goes, the, the, this is looking at patients with brain damage. Uh, and this goes all the way back to at least gladiatorial days. There is a Roman, uh, essentially a doctor in the Roman gladiatorial days named Galen, uh, very famous in the field of neuroscience. And Galen noticed that occasionally uh, some of the gladiators would get things like uh, spinal cord injuries or head injuries that would cause changes in their behavior. And he began to notice certain patterns and recorded some of them. That was the first you know, 2,000-ish years ago. Um, and then in the 1800s and late 1700s, uh, uh, Western physicians started doing something similar. And in the 1850s, Paul Pierre Broca uh, noticed that he had a couple of patients that would, he came in to see him, uh, and they exhibited what is now called Broca's aphasia, uh, and it is an inability to coordinate speech. So they can understand what you are asking them, you could say, hold up two fingers, and they would go like this. But then you could say, how many fingers are you holding up? And they would, they would, do, uh, they have trouble. I can't, I can't do the imitation quite as well. My, my PhD advisor, who's also a medical doctor and neurologist, could do it really well. Because uh, he sees these patients all the time. There's sort of a way of speaking that they have. Um, and so after a couple of his patients died, Broca 
examined their brains and found that two of the patients, or a couple of the patients at least, had lesions. They were missing part of their brain in relatively overlapping areas, uh, which we now call Broca's area. And Broca's area is now thought to play a very important role in coordinating the motor aspects of speech, which is incredibly complicated. It turns out fully half of the neurons in your brain at least are dedicated to movement. So you have an area in the back of the brain, right down here, a little cauliflower-shaped thing called the cerebellum. Literally means little brain. Sort of sticks off the brain stem, kind of. And that little thing contains half of the neurons in the brain. Um, and it seems to be doing all these rapid, fine calculations for uh, coordinating movements. So somebody who is missing a cerebellum entirely is kind of okay-ish. Surprisingly so for missing half of the neurons in their brain. Um, but they do have certain stereotypes of, of ways of walking and things like that, which is they sort of, they have a wide spread movement. Um, and uh, this gentleman here on the left, this is a reconstruction of where they think a bar passed through uh, Phineas Gage's brain. This is a classic case in neuroscience. If you've ever taken an introduction to neuroscience or even possibly intro to psychology, class, you've probably heard of Phineas Gage, a uh, very contentious patient in the history of, of neuroscience. If nothing else, it was amazing that he lived. So what happened was he was working as a, a foreman for a railroad company, and in order to clear uh, rocks and mountainsides away, in order to make room for the tracks, what they used to do would be drill holes into granite and then tamp it full of gunpowder and then get way the hell away and set off the charge. And they would use a tamping iron, which is about this long, to really pack the, the gunpowder in there. And uh, Phineas Gage was boom, boom, boom. And the tamping iron went shooting straight up through the frontal part of his brain, frontal lobes. And amazingly, he survived, despite the care of his physician. And I say <laughs> despite, because when you read the original reports, what happened was, uh, uh, to be very graphic, and I apologize, but. Um, he tried to clear away the bone fragments that were embedded in the brain, so he went up through and down through and just sort of, <laughs> sort of reached around. Um, we don't do that anymore. So, <coughs> if you get a head injury that damages your skull and it and pushes something into your, even a bullet, actually, we, I've, I've seen a couple of patients who got shot, they get a bullet, they just leave it in there. You do much more damage trying to reach in and pull the thing out than just leaving it in. Um, and so despite the care of his physician, he, he managed to survive. The, I think the tamping iron is on display at a museum in Harvard. Um, he's that famous of a case. Um, now we can actually disrupt brain functioning non-invasively. So this is Professor Rich Ivory. Uh, he was one of the professors at UC Berkeley, a fantastic guy. Uh, literally wrote the book on cognitive neuroscientists. And here he is getting his brain zapped. Press the start. Okay. This is a transcranial magnetic stimulator. So the eye twitch that you see is actually secondary. Uh, it's, it's also hitting the muscles between the stimulator and his brain, so it's causing the eye to twitch. And a little bit of the jaw. So he's, he's obviously very happy about this. <laughs> it doesn't actually hurt. It just feels like somebody lightly kind of flicking you. It feels a little bit strange. Um, so if I, if I zap uh, somebody's, we say zap, that's not the technical term. <laughs> if I electrically stimulate, transiently electrically stimulate uh, Broca's area, I can induce speech of failure. Meaning uh, you could be reading something and saying, Jack and Jill went up the, 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 and then I turn the stimulator off and you're okay. Um, and that's basically adding noise to the circuit. So you have some sort of speech circuit that's coordinating all the neurons to communicate effectively, and then you blast it with noise and they, they can't coordinate their information flow anymore. Um, and the reason this works is, like I said, electrical activity doesn't get out of the skull because the, the skull smooths it all out. So all of the neurons in your brain work using electrochemical signals, and we can pick up on those, we can eavesdrop on those, except the skull smooths that signal out. Um, but the brain, the skull, and all the intervening tissues, while, although they're opaque to electrical fields, they're transparent to magnetic fields. And so if you take two overlapping magnetic fields and you, you induce a current, uh, wherever they overlap is where the current gets induced. And if that overlap happens to be about that far down, 
then you can induce an electro electrical current uh, in the actual cortex, in the surface of your brain. Uh, so it's a very clever, very simple technology. Um, it's being used pretty frequently. I use it in my lab. Uh, and the history of brain stimulation goes pretty far back. This is a picture of Jose Manuel Rodriguez Delgado. Uh, and I said that in a very Midwestern Delgado. Uh, that's not how you actually pronounce it. Uh, anyway, so he had this idea about um, where in the brain aggression may partially reside. And so uh, people didn't believe him. He had a lot of skeptics, a lot of doubters. And so in order to prove his theory correct, he implanted a stimulator in that part of a bull's brain and got in the ring with the bull and let it charge him. And he had a little remote control and he pressed the button and the bull stopped in his tracks and turned around and walked away. Um, I really believe in my science. <laughs> I do not believe in any of my hypotheses that strongly. <laughs> In fact, back in, the, uh, back in the early days of electrical stimulation research in the 50s and 40s, uh, different brain areas could be stimulated, uh, such as the amygdala, to elicit uh, aggression-like behaviors. Um, now we use non-invasive non imaging techniques. We can look at brain structure and function using MRI and functional MRI, as well as connectivity between brain regions using diffuser ten diffusion tensor imaging and similar technologies. So these are uh, mapping connections between brain areas, the wires that connect them, the axons. So what about scanning the zombie brain? <laughs> Carl. <laughs> yes, that's a brain. Carl's awful character. I feel terrible for saying a child in a TV show is awful, but he is just a terrible character in that show. He's, he's, he is responsible for so many people dying in that show. Um, <clears throat> None of our brain scanning looks like this. <laughs> it is very crude and mostly statistical, right? So if you ever hear somebody say they have discovered, uh, there's a TED talk actually that was recent where a guy said, uh, a neuroscientist said that he had a, um, I think it was a serial killer's brain or something like that. Um, brain imaging is a statistical process. Men are on average taller than women. If you tell me that you are five foot eight and I have no other information about you, I cannot tell you if you're a man or a woman. I could say you are, you have a 47% chance of being female, 53% chance of being male. That's it, right? That is the kind of thing that we're talking about in neuroscience for almost always. It's these statistical kinds of things. So yes, there are statistically detectable differences in perhaps brain structure between psychopaths and non-psychopaths, but they are small and they are non-predictive. So the fact that this neuroscientist went up and said, I have a brain of a psychopath, that, uh, that drives us crazy. It drives us crazy. <laughs> um, so here we're making inferences about what a brain must look like uh, in the zombie based upon the exact errors that I was telling you. Um, and so you can see it looks different. The cerebellum is that little region in the back here. And we think that it's been disrupted pretty, pretty heavily in the zombie brain. Uh, it's zombie is missing large portions of its frontal lobe, uh, parts of its sensory motor cortex, its motor language and speech areas. And like I already showed you, this is the overlap between what we think a human and zombie brain might look like. Nothing that could ever happen to you would ever turn you into a zombie, ever. I have to reiterate that. So uh, I have a few more minutes, so we're gonna talk quickly about some symptoms, aggression. This is a violent scene, by the way, sorry. So in, in 28 days later, there's a rage virus that infects everybody. Notice he got infected and within about 20 seconds, he turns into a zombie. So where, what do we know about aggression? Well, not a whole lot. We don't even have very good definitions of a lot of these terms. Uh, that everybody agrees upon. But we do know that we can control impulsive responses. Um, and some of those impulses that people have tend to be aggressive. So if you know, uh, somebody uh, insults you, uh, if you are of the type of person that does this, your inclination may be to hit them, uh, but you can use your higher cognitive functioning to inhibit that response. And if you have been drinking, say, uh, that ability to inhibit that response may be affected. Um, and in rare cases, 
where there's frontal lobe dysfunction, specifically here in the orbital frontal cortex, which is very cleverly named because it's right above the orbit at the front. Uh, then you have some inhibition problems. So this is the best we can go with, is that there are some inhibitory problems, perhaps, in the zombies. They can't inhibit their responses. Uh, and we quantify that with a totally made up number of 85% atrophy of the orbital frontal cortex. <laughs> <laughs> so the survival tip, don't fight them. You can't win. They are more aggressive than you, fundamentally. Symptom two is amnesia. This is Big Daddy. That's his name in the film. You're trying to be us. So a zombie hits, to be us. hits the bell. Gotta be us again. No way. And the former so gas station worker walks those out. Things. I've been walking, but there's a big difference between us and them. They're dead. It's actually pretty amazing it's like they're pretending to be alive. how often this shows up in zombie films. Sure where in Shaun of the Dead, uh, there's a scene towards the end where this occurs, and I don't want to give it away just in case somebody hasn't seen it, but there's a similar kind of thing where old pre-zombieism habitual type behaviors seem to be remaining intact. Uh, and that's actually pretty incredible that the directors and writers intuited this because this actually can and does happen in, in certain cases of amnesia. So there's two kinds of amnesia. Retrograde and anterograde. Uh, retrograde is you forget something that happened in the past. So that's sort of what happens with like soap operas and stuff. You wake up and you don't remember who you are or where you come from, right? Like the Jason Bourne identity stuff. That doesn't really happen, honestly, uh, very much. What does happen and can happen in rare cases is anterograde amnesia, which is the inability to form new memories. Um, and this doesn't happen often. The classic case is Henry Malaison, um, and uh, this is a guy who had brain surgery for epilepsy, and both his left and right hippocampuses were surgically removed because that's where the epilepsy was coming from. And they don't do that surgery anymore, a bilateral hippocampectomy. Uh, the hippocampectomy. Uh, and that was done in, I think, oh, late 50s, early 60s, early 60s. Um, he just recently passed away for that time span of decades in between the surgery and when he passed away. His memory span was only a few minutes and then he would sort of reset. Things before the surgery from his life he could remember clearly. Anything new, he couldn't, couldn't create. Um, and uh, so it's, it's actually, there, there's a couple of books written about him. It's a fascinating tale in the history of neuroscience. Um, Radiolab, if you've ever heard of the Radiolab podcast, they actually did a piece about him. Um, and it's, it's incredibly moving, actually. It, you, when you really stop and think about what it must be like, because um, you can hold on to things and then they disappear. If you've ever seen the movie Memento, they actually did a pretty decent job, I think, of uh, showing what that memory reset, I mean, minus the tattoos and killing and guns and stuff like that. Um, they actually did a pretty decent job, from what I understand, of, of illustrating anterograde amnesia. And so we argue that zombies have a form of anterograde amnesia, uh, where they don't remember, they can't remember anything new they do remember things, sort of habits from their previous lives. So here is uh, HM. Uh, we, he was patient HM for decades in literature. After he died, his, his family agreed to release his name, which was Henry Malaison. That's where the hippocampus is used to be. You're now looking at coronal slices through the brain this way, and those are right towards the middle. So human. We're not saying HM, we are never, ever, ever, ever saying anybody with brain lesions or damage or anything like a zombie, by the way. Uh, I got into the field because of family members who had issues, neurological issues. Um, I got into the field and so I work with people who have strokes and brain damage uh, because my goal is to try and figure some of this stuff out. Um, I take a statistical approach to my research, which is I could have been a medical doctor and for certain helped some people on a one-to-one -one basis, but instead I went into research because I may discover nothing that helps anybody, but I could discover one thing that helps a lot of people. Right? So I took a statistical approach to my career path. Um, I don't want to trivialize any of that stuff. Um, so survival tip number two, back to making jokes, is to keep quiet and wait it out because they might just forget about you. <laughs> Attention deficits. 
How come you guys always go out at night? Want to be safer in the daytime? Fireworks, kid. These dentists can't keep their eyes off of you. Tambourine zombie is one of my favorite zombies. <laughs> so what's happening? There is some stimulus in the external world that has captured their attention. If somebody came screaming in from the back of the room, everybody would go, huh? Like that. We do that. That is just part of being the animals that we are. Our attention is captured by surprising things. You can inhibit that. If I tell you somebody will come screaming in the back of the room, ignore them, you can do that. You can use your are we humans can use our higher cognitive functions to inhibit stimulus-driven attention capture. Uh, there are certain kinds of disorders in the brain. One is called Balance Syndrome, which is a dysfunction of the posterior bilateral uh, parietal cortices. Uh, doesn't really matter. What does matter is the effect. Uh, and one of the effects of Balance Syndrome is stimulus-driven attention capture. And another one, the brain is funky, is called simultagnosia, or simultanagnosia, sorry, which is your inability to observe more than one thing at a time. For people who have simultanagnosia, they say it's sort of like seeing the world in still frame. Uh, and so they have a very hard time observing more than anything, more than one of anything at, at a time. Um, there's the posterior parietal cortex. So given what we know about attention, Something would have to be wrong with the way that this is communicating with the rest of the brain. So, survival tip three, distract them. <laughs> and a lot of video games, again, like uh, Left 4 Dead series actually makes really good use of this, where you have little beeping bombs, and you, so you throw this thing and it goes beep, 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 and all the zombies go running after it because it's, it's a novel stimulus, and then it blows up and kills them all. <laughs> it's a great game, game series, by the way. Uh, I argue that a lot of the resurgence in, in the zombie genre thing for the last like five or six years has actually been driven by video games. Uh, there have been some amazing video games in the zombie genre. So this is from a friend's cheesy homemade movie uh, called Dead at the Box Office. <laughs> but he did a very good job of having all of his friends poorly act the stereo, oh, it's really hard to see, the, the zombie lumber, right? Their buddy, that doesn't, he doesn't make it. Um, so that's the stereotypical zombie walk uh, for the slow zombies, right? Whether or not you know, zombie people care about fast versus slow zombies. Fast zombies aren't real zombies to zombie people. Um, so why is there a fast versus slow zombie thing? So we say there are two subtypes of CDHD. <laughs> There's a slow and fast subtype. And the slow subtype the cerebellum is, is largely damaged or dysfunctional, whereas in the fast zombie subtype, they have better motor coordination and better spatial abilities, which is why they can continue moving so fast. So large parts of the posterior parietal cortex are probably spared, as well as the cerebellum. Why is this? Well, we think it, after, after a lot of making stuff up, uh, we really settled in on what we call the time to resurrection hypothesis. So, 28 days later, it was about a 20 second turnaround time between the infection and the, the zombieism. Uh, and that's incredibly fast, and he's a fast zombie. In Night of the Living Dead, the very slow, canonically, canonically slow zombies, it could be weeks, months, or even years that they were dead before they rose out of their graves. So that's the slow zombie subtype. So uh, all of these plots are totally made up, but it looks really nice. Uh, and so. <laughs> It's way easier to make up data, by the way. <laughs> Real science is hard. Nothing ever looks that good. Uh, so, severity of CDHD symptoms depends on incubation period. So survival tip four, outrun them, if it's the proper subtype. And actually, they do this a lot uh, in um, uh, the original Dawn of the Dead, where there, is that the, the yeah, it's the shopping mall one, right? Uh, they just, they don't care about individual zombies, right? They sort of like push them with a stick and run by. Because uh, no one zombie, slow zombie, is really a threat. Uh, unless you're just 
terrible at running away. Um, one thing I never understood about zombie movies is there's always a zombie that like, bites you from behind or grabs the ankle and bites you on the ankle and then they're turned. Like, I, I would wear a leather jacket or something like that. <laughs> right? like, you, it's really, you can't bite through leather very easily. And so I just never understood why they don't wear like, leather, leather you know, motorcycle pants and a leather jacket. That seems like that would save a lot of trauma. <laughs> All right, language deficits. This is actually uh, one of the rare cases of, of higher language functioning still intact, and we, we are unclear if it's actually linguistic. <laughs> Send more cops. He says, send more cops, because they've already eaten all the other cops. Um, <laughs> that may actually be an, a habit. Right? That may be from, from his previous uh, policeman life. So it may not actually be a linguistic thing. It may, may be a learned habit for him to say that. Um, another higher level function here is Tarman, my favorite zombie in the zombie history. Right, so that's brain. So Return to the Living Dead, which was uh, sort of, uh, some people really don't like it. It was a cheesy 80s uh, sort of comedy zombie film. Uh, I think it's fantastic. That's where the brains thing, I think, comes from. The zombies eating brains thing didn't actually show up until the 80s. Uh, Romero has never done anything like that. Um, so here's what we know about language, roughly speaking. In blue, you've got Broca's area. In green, you've got Wernicke's area. Patients uh, with damage to Broca's area can no longer coordinate speech. Uh, people with damage or dysfunction to Wernicke's area can no longer understand. Uh, they have fluent speech, but it doesn't make any sense. Uh, they'll, they'll put phonemes together and sort of write groupings, but it's not linguistic. Um, and even more strange is there's a heavy interconnection between these two brain regions uh, called the arcuate fasciculus. So these two brain regions are directly connected with a big bundle of fibers, white matter, which is the sort of axons that connect neurons together. And in rare cases where those fibers specifically are damaged, people can still understand speech and they can still speak clearly, but they have what's called repetition uh, aphasia, which is if you ask them to repeat a word that you say, they can't do it. Uh, so repetition seems to short circuit this, like it's a direct connection between these two regions. Uh, and so they can't actually directly repeat things that you ask them to repeat, but they can have a conversation with you. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. All right, this was the hardest thing for us to BS. Why don't zombies eat each other? And why can you mimic zombies in some movies and, and have them not attack you? So we really had to dig deep on the BS scale for this one, <laughs> but um, there, there, is, there is one syndrome in the medical literature uh, called the Capgras delusion. Oh, wait, is it, that? I don't want to get that wrong. Is that the right one? Capgras delusion? I'll have to look it up. I don't want to screw that up. Anyway, there, uh, uh, you don't have to name it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, there's one syndrome where you believe your loved ones have been replaced by imposters, and your response toward them is aggression. Uh, nobody knows what causes this or why. There are a couple of hypotheses. The strongest one is uh, the amygdala, a little almond-shaped part of your brain near the hippocampus towards the middle there, um, is responsible, it seems, for assigning emotional context to events and things in our lives. So amygdala is often popularly characterized as the fear part of the brain, not very accurate. Um, fear is one thing that it does, among tons of other things. So um, the idea is that the communication between the amygdala and the visual parts of your brain are, are disrupted in this syndrome. So if I see my wife, the photons entering my eye transform a into a neural signal, that, uh, without going into all the details about all trans retinol and all that kind of stuff, you don't have to worry about that, Enter my retina, hit the LGN, go back into my primary visual cortex, and I say, ah, it's my wife, as it propagates through the other visual areas, um, and enters the face area of my brain. We have, probably have a face area of our brains uh, where we do facial recognition, and we recognize people, and that face area and the amygdala are connected, and they communicate. So I can recognize my wife, but that amygdala isn't communicating with the face area that that is your wife whom you love, and so you have the recognition of the person, but not the emotional context that goes with them. And so 
what happens in a lot of cases of brain injury and brain damage and things like that is that uh, you will make something up. Um, and this is called confabulation. This, this is pretty, pretty common. So rather than address and say, you know, I don't know, or something must be wrong with the way my brain is functioning, you make up a story. And so the idea is that these patients may be confabulating and saying, the reason that that doesn't feel like my wife isn't because I no longer, my amygdala is no longer assigning emotional context to the facial recognition of my wife, it's because she's not my wife. Um, and she's an imposter of some sort. Well, that's why she doesn't feel like my wife. And so we think zombies have this facial recognition intact, but whatever the signal the amygdala is sending is totally screwing up and causing normal people to appear as imposters or threats. So that was the hardest one. We we're quite proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the future of zombie survival? Remote controlled animals are already a thing. We can insert electrodes into rats' brains and use the little electrical stimulators to, to make the rats decide to move, not just control where they move, but we can electrically stimulate just the right areas to make them decide to move certain ways. This is actually shown in the movie Fido, we think to some degree, which is also a fantastic movie, uh, where all of the zombies are given these collars that keep them under control. Trinity falls in love. And uh, this is one of the strangest scenes in Land of the Dead. Mindless walking corpses, and many of us will be too if you don't stay focused on the task at hand. Zombies, man. <laughs> they creep me out. Together. Zombies, they creep me out. I want to know if the director asked him to do that, or if the nose picking was just something he decided to do. But it was such a great scene. Anyway, so that's it. It's 3 o'clock. I'm going to end it on the hour. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> So we have time for some questions. Uh, if you have zombie questions or, or brain questions, we'll take them. Let's start in the back there. Yeah. Does the brain zapping cause short or long term effects of any kind? Uh, no. So does the brain zapping cause any long term effects? Uh, so at very high stimulation rates, uh, it can induce seizures. And so the protocols for doing these studies always require you to be an order of magnitude below that minimum threshold for causing this, the seizures or so, something like that. Um, and other than that, no, we, we call it, uh, my, 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 I have a friend who calls it localized drunkenness. Um, <laughs> so it can uh, alter the way that that area functions for approximately a minute to minute mapping. So if I stimulate for 10 minutes, you have uh, altered communication in that region for 10 minutes and then it re recovers without any long-term effects. And there's been extensive studies on animals and stuff doing this. Yeah. Uh, there is a movie, I think it's Z Nation, uh, where the guy injects, has himself injected with some kind of pathogen in order to camouflage himself from the zombies because the zombies will only attack fresh meat. Can you comment on that in terms of... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I will only attack healthy, healthy meat. But, but your last clip kind of, not your last clip, the one before that kind of shows Normal people walking among the zombies and so. We so, there are, there are multiple other signals, right? So, in, in Shaun of the Dead, uh, one inference would be okay, so in, in um, Walking Dead, I think it was like the second episode, they actually covered themselves in undead gore uh, to mask their normal healthy smell. So, the question is can humans smell healthy humans well enough to identify them? absent any other behavioral thing. So you can act like them, but can the zombies still smell that you're not a zombie? Um, and I don't know what the pathogen is doing, but some other kind of detection mechanism, right? So it turns out humans actually have surprisingly good sense of smell. We don't realize it. There's actually a really great study done by a, a friend at Berkeley a couple of years ago where they took a backpack uh, with a laptop computer in it and uh, had people blindfolded and earplugged and gloved and had, uh, had them crawl around on their hands and knees in grass where they had traced scent trails and people could actually detect and follow these scent trails. They had the backpack to detect their location and see that they would perfectly follow these scent trails if they had no other stimuli coming in. We over rely on our sense of vision and then hearing, but if everything else is cut away, they could actually do this. So we actually may have 
good sense of smell. And it turns out, so maybe zombies uh, have some sensory deficits. We can re rebound. Other senses get amplified, right? So the classic example is um, uh, people who are uh, either congenitally blind or uh, blind later in life, their sense of hearing will improve and their sense of touch. I can't read Braille. I can't even feel the difference between the dots. Um, but over time, we can learn to make those discriminations, right? So maybe the zombie sense of smell is ramped up. Sense of smell is also very weird uh, because it's all of our senses, touch, uh, sound, smell, taste, get relayed through a brain area before entering our consciousness in the, in the cortex, except for the sense of smell, which directly goes into the cortex. It doesn't go through this relay. Um, and that's probably because it's evolutionarily older than all the others, probably, right? Saying why is, is a very tricky question in science, of course. But um, so there may be something to the sense of smell thing. Who knows? Yeah. Um, my wife suffers from multiple sclerosis, and I'm always trying to uh, get information about any work that's being done on that. And I wonder if you know anything about it. The most interesting thing I think I've read recently is, have you guys been paying any attention to the microbiome stuff? So the microbiome research, for those of you who don't know, is we have more non-us cells in our body than actually the cells that are us, right? Like the cells that we create with our DNA in them. Um, and most of those reside in the gut, the intestines, things like that. And there's been a ton of research growing right now looking into fecal transplantation. So taking somebody with healthy microbiota from the gut and giving that to somebody with gut abnormalities. And I think MS is one of those scenarios where they've been doing these fecal transplants that have been, you know, early results being somewhat positive. So the, there's a ton of work looking at the relationship between the gut and uh, our, our central nervous system. So that's, that's all I know. It's very coarse and loose. I don't really know anything else about it, but it's one of the more fascinating novel directions of research that I've seen in the last five or 10 years. Yeah. So how do you think these zombie frames uh, uh, react to uh, like an anti-schizophrenic drug? I'm not, I'm not sure, right? Uh, uh, I'm not very clear on pharmacology. I'm not a pharmacologist person, uh, uh, so I'll be upfront about that. Um, anything I say will be, I mean, unlike all of the other making stuff up, it's worse <laughs> making stuff up. Right? It's like not accurate making stuff up, which I feel is bad, so I don't want to do that. <laughs> Tetrodotoxin, TTX. So we actually do, do address this in our book. So zombie comes from the word zombie, N-Z-A-M-B-I, um, which means uh, soulless or something like that. Um, and it, the idea originally, the, the original zombie movie was White Zombie back in, I think, like the 20s or 30s um, about these voodoo rituals uh, where supposedly um, a voodoo priest, a bokor, an evil priest, could take control of somebody's soul. And Wade Davis, who was an anthropologist, uh, went down to Haiti to, to study this. And this is where the book The Serpent and the Rainbow came from, which is actually interesting and totally unlike the pretty terrible movie from the 80s. Um, well, it, it was good in its own right, but not, not a very good reflection of the research. Um, and the idea was that uh, proper amounts of tetrodotoxin, uh, which is a paralytic in a lot of ways, so it actually uh, stops neurons from functioning properly for a short period of time. Too much, all the neurons stop and you die. Um, but just the right amount can make it look like you're in a torpor-like you know, uh, state of uh, death, but not death. This is actually used in the, the A-Team movie remake. Among several other films, it's sort of a thing that they use where they make it look like somebody's dead and then they bring them back. Um, and so supposedly, what was done in these rituals, uh, according to Wade Davis, was these bokor, these evil priests, would use this tetrodotoxin to put people into this uh, dead-like state. The family would think they were dead, and then they would give them, I think, scopolamine drugs, so drugs like natural plants that, that essentially caused vast hallucinations and, and uh, made them you know, more um, psychologically malleable and would convince them that they were dead, but the, they had been risen by this priest. So that was supposedly, I think, the origin of where this idea of zombie came from, but that was somebody sort of mind-controlling uh, the creatures, or the people. I shouldn't say creatures, right? These are real people, supposedly, that this happened to. Um, uh, yeah, and then... Um, I don't know much about zombies, 
but I, I, I was thinking about your the, the assumptions that you're making underlying the brain, especially the physiology. That if you're if you have MRIs and EEGs of active neural activity, that means that you've got uh, you've got nutrients, uh, you've got <laughs> blood, you've got. Uh, I mean, if you, you so so you've got. A zombie would have to have a beating heart, uh -huh. and it would have to breathe to bring oxygen in, into whatever is 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 making a, a, a you know a neural bed that that has uh, you know, the energy potential for, for to, to the. Basically, that's the Achilles heel of the entire thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my question: Are, are zombies the Walking Dead, or are they truly are are they not dead. Well, again, it depends, right? So George Romero's take is, yes, they're dead. Right? At which point all of this is moot because there's no nutrients. And uh, there's, a, there's a, a friend of ours, a colleague of ours, Steve Schlotzman at Harvard. Uh, he's a psychiatrist there. And he, he's done a, his own zombie brain take, too. And he has this whole bit about, um, do zombies poop? <laughs> 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 they're always eating people. Where does it go, right? Um, <laughs> And so, so he has this whole take about why is it that zombies may or may not poop, and so what does that say about the rest of the physiology being intact or not intact? Um, but yeah, we don't really... The rage-infected zombies, the virus, the viral ones, the fungal ones, right? We would then argue that yes, they actually have intact physiology otherwise. Um, but for the dead ones, then you're talking about, well, how do they raise from the dead? Then you get into supernatural, which isn't as amenable to making up the physiological basis as everything else. So. Uh, yeah. I just kind of have a basic hypothetical about bioelectricity because that's obviously really important when you can uh -huh. use electricity and everything. So I know it's probably very hard because I, I assume we generate the electricity or in some way to have it naturally. So if you could hypothetically completely drain someone of electricity, would they die? Drain them of electricity? Like so this is actually a big question like the cryonics yeah. research is in you, if you freeze somebody, right? All of their cells, if you do it just right, all of their cells, everything is directly intact. Uh, we know the heart can restart, but the heart has its own pacemaking uh, system. But the question is, will neural activity pick up where it left off just because of where everything was? And that's actually a major question. It's been done, I guess, in some animals, and they seem okay, but it's hard to query them and ask them, <laughs> right? Um, but that's essentially what you're asking, I think. And so we don't really know, honestly. We have no idea. Uh, yeah. I'd like to ask you to uh, extrapolate the culture. Sci-fi is often a reflection of our anxieties, you know, yeah. aliens uh, show up periods of xenophobia, robots are really, wor wor really worried about people becoming robotic. So just take a guess, why the zombie uh, concentration? What are we noticing in our culture that zombies uh, give us a, a representation of? I think they're, so, I think zombies are a really good blank slate. Writers can, blank slate. Writers can project whatever cultural fear. With the original Night of the Living Dead, it was about race relations. Right? Dawn of the Dead by Romero was about consumerism. Uh, Return of the Living Dead, which was the tongue in cheek one, was about uh, nuclear war and radiation. 28 days later are these rage infested monkeys. It's a virus that gets out. Um, and there's been zombie movies about uh, space exploration, right? There's been zombie movies about genetic manipulation. There's been zombie movies about technological manipulation. Uh, there's been a zombie movie called Pontypool, where the zombie virus isn't a virus at all. What spreads zombieism is language, the way we communicate. Can ideas, memetics, can ideas spread in a, in a harmful fashion through a culture? So I think it's just a fantastic template for writers to use. Uh, and so I, I think that's, that's why it's so popular, because it can be anything, right? It's like Freddy Krueger is just Freddy Krueger, right? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, there were, I lived in uh, some, uh, might be in Africa, I don't know, but is it any number to notice that they do Are there any zombie-like things in other societies? Right, I, 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 that's a fine question. We didn't... We didn't really do that kind of cultural look uh, in our book. There are, of course, things kind of like that, right? Where um, if you take it, the original voodoo zombie, where it's essentially mind control, right? You lose your soul. 
there are, of course, then parallels in many cultures. Right? We all, multiple cultures have, have their monsters where somebody has lost control, they no longer have their soul. I mean, ultimately, there's, the, there's a loss of control, loss of sense of self. Can your loved ones be replaced by something that wants to hurt you? Right? And I think that shows up across many, many cultures. So it depends on how loosely you want to approach the idea, but... Yeah. Is this psychological? Is it psychological? What's that? Is, is it psychological? I mean, is it talking about the mind? Don't be actually your psychological disorder. No, 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 no. No, but I, I, think, I think that that's the best take as to why they're popular in different cultures. Things like that are popular in different cultures because it hits something psychologically fun, right? Going back to the question about uh, why zombies. The other big thing I think it hits on is essential existential terror that a lot of us have, right? What is the self? Who are we? And what does it take for us to flip over into something bestial? And I, I think, I think that's, that's pretty ubiquitous. <laughs> I was wondering if you could relate this in some way to anesthesia-induced dementia. My wife recently had surgery and exhibited non recognition of her doctors thinking they were fakes. Aggressive behavior when she's not an aggressive, I mean, very aggressive behavior. Inability to put a coherent sentence together, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do we have anesthesia-induced zombies, maybe? <laughs> we, we, we definitely have anesthesia-induced unconscious or lack of conscious awareness. Right, so in the book we talk about somnambulism, sleepwalking, as a pretty relatively normal everyday case of doing some behavior without being consciously aware of the behavior. I, apparently, according to my wife, uh, when I woke up the first few times after being under, I was saying some pretty silly stuff and being really ridiculous, and I have no memory of it. Um, and anesthesia, if you haven't been under general anesthesia, is phenomenally weird because you sort of start to feel like you're going out for a second, and then you blink and you're awake, and it's some hours later, and normally, like when you sleep, when you lose consciousness, you are aware of a passage of time. With anesthesia, there is no awareness of a passage of time. You're there, and then half a second again you're there, but there's been hours missing. So I think anesthesia is fascinating. I actually have a colleague who studies anesthesia and consciousness. Um, and so I don't have an idea, but it's a fantastic tool for studying. Uh, I, 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 whoops, that was my alarm saying I need to go to the train station soon. So I can do one more question and then chat up here for a few more minutes, yeah. Uh, you mentioned John of the Dead. Was that where a biker gang is fighting zombies in a shopping mall? Yeah. yeah. And so you said leathers are good. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, but are they wearing full leathers or just the vest, right? So it really, it does matter. <laughs> All right, sorry everyone, thanks. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you again. <laughs>